Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us here for another episode, wherever in the world you are listening to us from, whatever platform you're listening to us on. Thank you guys so much for the continued support and for listening uh, to this episode as we continue on our journey on two years of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Uh, Today's topic, as I was talking with my guest uh, just now, uh, is one that's personal to me because we're talking about something that I run (laughs) as a coach and is something that I, I, I really like in terms of pressing and uh, as the title of the episode suggests, we are going to be talking about the 221 press, which uh, is a very popular one. Many of you uh, may be familiar with it. Um, it's, it's one that there's a lot that can go into it. There's a lot of refinement. There's a lot of ways that, that you can go about teaching it. And uh, if it's not something you've looked at or know a lot about, I uh, would highly recommend that you take a look at it. And if you do, uh, know some things about it. Uh, hopefully this episode will help maybe give you a little bit of uh, some ideas, some tips and tricks, or just get you to reflect a little bit about how you run it and uh, what you do compared to uh, what me and my guests do. So there's going to be something in this for everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be joined today by the head boys basketball coach at IVC High School. Coach Quinn Morrow is joining us. Coach, thank you so much. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm doing quite well, doing quite well. And I, I love pressing. I love the two two one. So this this is Right up my alley. So as I was saying to you, I'm, I'm looking forward to learning just as much as those listening are. Uh, Coach, let's go ahead and get started with your journey. And I know we talked about off air, there's football involved in that journey, but where's, uh, where, where's kind of your journey taking you, the, the basketball steps, the other sports steps, and, and what were the steps along the way that got you to uh, IVC? Sure. So yeah, I uh, actually, you know, played all the sports, went to a small high school, played all the sports in, in high school, football, basketball, baseball, and track. My school was so small. Um, but then went on and played football in college and, uh, you know, loved it, had opportunities to play basketball, had opportunities to play baseball too, but football was what we were good at in high school. So you kind of gravitate towards those things I've found. Uh, mm-hmm. So did that uh, and then actually started coaching football at, at Milliken um, and married my wife while I was there. Well, she actually got a, uh, she was an assistant coach at Milliken and they won the national title on the women's side. So she got a high school job while I'm coaching at Millican and I actually transitioned into insurance at the time. And she said, I can't find an assistant. Why don't you be my assistant? So uh, I said, sure, I'll do it. I don't ever have any intention of coaching girls basketball, but let's try it. Uh, and coached with her for 15 years. Uh, was her assistant wow. for 15 <laughs> years um, at three different schools. Uh, we uh, had some success and, and really liked it. And we've done a little bit of everything, uh, including this, the two, two, one that we're going to talk about today. Uh, and then I guess it was four years ago, my son, my oldest was going to be a seventh grader. They're going to be an eighth grader. And he did not have his games were starting at four thirty, So I took a year off mm-hmm. and, uh, we have three boys and I said, you know what, I think I'm going to try to see if I had boys job comes up and see if I can go get it. Thinking I had no chance uh, being a girl's assistant. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dan Camp and the IVC administration interviewed me and offered it to me. And uh, here I am three years, three years into it and, and, and loving it, love being on the boys' side. And then what's even funnier to all of it is now my wife came over this year uh, as my assistant oh, on the wow. boys' side. Um, so Neat. I've got pretty successful coach on my staff now that's got, you know, 250 plus wins in her career and uh, five regional titles. So hopefully she can help us get over the hump here oh that that's excellent that, that's that's really cool how that worked out and I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna have you do do a quick little uh a plug for the for the girls side if you don't mind as somebody who is a girls basketball coach i know sometimes uh when males get into the coaching profession they're a little skittish or a little hesitant or maybe in some cases completely unwilling to even give the the girls side a chance in, in terms of coaching it so um, what, what did you enjoy about coaching the girls side? Cause clearly you, you, you stuck around on, on the girls side for a long time. Uh, what, what, what did you I- enjoy in particular about getting to work with the girls? Well, I absolutely loved coaching the girls. Uh, it's something that I would do again in a heartbeat. I would never, uh, 
take anything away from from girls basketball. I've I've really told a lot of people that I you know I almost enjoy coaching girls more at times just simply because they they listen so much better than they want, <laughs> want, want to please. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I, I've, I found this out. I have been very fortunate here at, at IBC. I've had some good teams and, and amazing kids. So I don't want to take anything away from the boys side, but the, the girls that we've coached, they, they work and they work and work. And sometimes they're not as worried about being embarrassed yeah, as boys are. Uh, and I, I really, I, I love that. And I just like to see them, see them succeed. And I, I've, Basketball is getting better um, from the standpoint of it's not as much one-on-one, but I said, if you want to watch true basketball and you want to talk to some really good coaches, go watch girls basketball Yeah, and, uh, go, you know, go, go talk to some of their coaches because on the boys' side, you usually have one boy that regardless of what happens, he can pull up and take a shot over someone or he can yeah. just do something Create and get his a own shot offense, off. Yes, yes. And, and, and girls, if you find one that can, we've had a couple – Mm. Uh, you're really good. Better but, hold uh, on to them. <laughs> yes, but she, uh, you know, at, coach on the girl side, they really work together. And that's, uh, like I said, I, I would tell anyone to, if, if you get a chance to coach girls, uh, go for it because it, it's worth it. Excellent. I appreciate that plug too. Yes. Go coach girls. If you have the opportunity, I love it. And co- coach, coach guy is great too, but I, I, I don't like when I see, really good potential coaches who turn away positions or turn away getting their foot in the door in coaching just because they're like skittish of coaching girls. I'm like, no, give it a shot. You'll, you'll be pleasantly surprised at how much you like it. Yeah. We, we had an assistant coach at uh, Milliken that, you know, my wife learned so much from when he was there. Uh, Dick Marshall was his name. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I asked him when I first took over as the assistant, I said, you know, what do you suggest? I'm coming from coaching college football guys to, <laughs> you know, girls basketball. He goes, you coach them and they'll learn. He says you treat them how they need to be treated and, and treat them like a coach and they'll respond to it. And I've never forgotten that. Uh, the kids will give you what your expectations are. Yeah, that, that's them. That's really well put. Uh, we talked about um, off air as, as we were kind of having a little bit of back and forth about one of the things that you, that you love is stealing points. And, and I think that there's probably a connection there with uh, the topic of the press itself. But yeah. To have you flesh that out, what what is what does stealing points mean to you in terms of the way that you coach your team or or your coaching philosophy? Where does the idea of, of stealing points kind of fit in there? So it's it, for me, stealing points is it's transition points, it's turnover points, it's it's anything that you can in an opportunity to score where there's no defense or not a set defense. Um, defenses are so good now and. You know, they've got so many different ones that you're going to face throughout a season. I think we faced, you know, four or five different defenses this year. Uh, if I can get you out in transition or off of turnovers, but mostly turning that transition, you have a chance to steal points throughout the game. Uh, I almost think of it like it's a special teams in football. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, those the kickoffs and the kickoff returns and the punts and the punt returns, those are opportunities to score where not everyone's in a set position waiting for you to come at them. Uh, and that's where, uh, on my side, uh, we teach from the time that we get the defense rebound, the first five seconds of that possession are yours. Hmm. So you can do whatever you want offensively and just take off. Uh, we, we, t- we work on a lot of transition drills as far as making them, you know, run lanes and, and spacing and talk about all of those things. But the, the gist of it for me is you have five seconds. After that, at that first five seconds, take whatever shot you can get that's a good shot for you. Um, but after that, you've got to set up by offense and we've got to run stuff. Uh, and that seems to break it down easy for them because you count in practice. And, you know, I, I tell them, I said, if a team scores on us in three seconds, I'd like to be scoring again on them. If you'll just get out and run and pass the ball. And uh, we've been really good at, it at times and, and not as good at other times. But, well, it's, it's interesting uh, you bring that up. Cause I, cause I hear, I hear multiple coaches kind of bring that up that some people don't think about that. Like sometimes your best transition opportunities are after you, uh, you know, give up a basket before the, before they set up. Like you can almost run like a fast break, almost transition type opportunity just right after that sort of situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a lot of times, especially if, if people are trying to set up their defenses, they're running down the floor looking at who they're supposed to be guarding. Well, if they've already gotten behind them after the score, maybe we can get, you know, a quick pass over the top or a quick couple passes and get a layup and a foul. And uh, I, I, 
try to tell my kids, I said, there's nothing more demoralizing than having to work for 30 seconds to score. And then three seconds later, you're getting a layup. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's just, yeah. it's one of those, you can just, it's a mental thing. And that's why I like this press so much as well, is it, it's just pressure all the mm-hmm. time. Yeah. And, and let's kind of transition ourselves right, right into that. And, and this kind of goes right into the first question I was going to ask you, but from a philo- philosophical standpoint, uh, we all know that there's plenty of different types of presses uh, that, that one can run and they all have the reasons why people like to run them. So let's just talk uh, philosophically. What about the, uh, the two, two, one press itself? Do, do you find that you like the most? You don't see it much. Uh, I, there's, I think I saw one, I've seen one other school in the last three years that has ran it uh, and they didn't run it. I would call it the Wahlberg way, uh, the run and jump from, from behind. They ran it more of a traditional two, two, one, and they'd run from a, you know, in front of you and come up and try to run and jump you. And it's just, it, it's a different press that you have to prepare for. Uh, It's not something that everyone runs. I mean, I, I think at least in Illinois, if, if I set up at a one, two, two, Every team in the state knows how to set up a press break for a one two two, but then I get into a you know the two two one and they're looking at looking at me and and going oh man we had to work on this at practice I had a coach this year tell me he goes I love your press he goes I can't do it but I love it <laughs> I thought that I <laughs> thought that I, was I, I hate playing against it too <laughs> yeah uh, and and that's what uh, I, I thought that was it was a really good compliment from the standpoint of he goes you know I love that you guys do it. And he goes, I'd like to do it. I just, you have to commit to it. Uh, that, that's the biggest thing. And and it's like anything, though, if you don't commit to it, none of it will work. But yeah, I'd, the pressure is what I like about it more than anything. It's different and there's always pressure. If somebody were to uh, be looking up the uh, 2-2 press right now and they're, they're ready to you know, dive themselves into it. Uh, as, as you mentioned, one of the first things they're going to, you know, see right away is, is, is the Vance Wahlberg and, and the way that that's implemented and run. Um, how much of what you do on your 221 is, uh, like, directly from him and how much is it of, like, variations that we make? So I kind of, like, set it up for the listeners so they know, like, it, how, how much of a twist, if any, you, you put on it versus what they'll find on, like, the Vance Wahlberg one. Sure. So uh, I would say we are 75% verbatim with what he is doing or with what he has taught. I know he's, he's even morphed into it himself. Um, but yeah, we're about 75% that we would actually do some things this year, which we haven't done in the past where we would play a traditional two, two, one on a make and a, uh, the Wahlberg two, two, one on a miss or switch it up. And just try to do it uh, because we found that I know we might talk about this later, but uh, we found that most people want to pass through it now. Uh, so we had to, we had a new set of kids coming in this year. Uh, I graduated eight seniors last year. So I brought, you know, new kids in this year and we ended up teaching the two, two, one in its normal rotations uh, and then introduced the, the run and jump part of it just because the kids didn't know the actual rotations if someone was passing and that we found out it was the easiest. Hmm. It was that, was that something that came as like a surprise to you? Was that, was that like an adjustment you had, you had to make? It, it was. Yeah. I, I, uh, you know, with last year, not, not this season, but the last season being a, a COVID season here in Illinois, we only got, uh, our team only played 13 games. Uh, but I had eight seniors and arguably one of the best teams in the state. Uh, and they, I had them for the second year because the all those kids were varsity kids as juniors and were seniors with me. So I didn't have to do as much teaching as far as they just kind of got the pressure part of it. And we implemented, we got 13 games last season and, and we implemented the full on, all right, we're going to do this, make, miss, we're just going uh, about four games into it because I was trying to make it as much anything fun for the kids. Uh, knowing that yeah. they didn't have anything to play for, uh, trying to get them involved and, in, you know, invested in doing something that's theirs. Uh, so they really did that. My seniors this season, uh, we had, I had seven seniors, which was another great group as far as numbers. But they, uh, of all those seven of the 13 games we played the year before, none of them got to play more than 
uh, five to six games simply because of, of COVID or, yeah. uh, or they were quarantined or, or some of those issues. So I, it was really like having a whole new team this year uh, that, that the last time they got true basketball, they were sophomores. Mm. Um, so we yeah. were, we were trying to just adjust on the fly, trying to find things that, that worked for them. And, and they were actually better in a traditional two, two, one than they were in the, the Wahlberg one. So let's, let, let's, as somebody who's, who's straight out of the, 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 the Wahlberg camp myself, I, I know, you know, we got the controller gapper taker. We got, we got all, all mm-hmm. the terminology that, that, that he uses. How, is, is that similar terminology and similar philosophies? Are there things that you, uh, use straight from that when you when you're talking about different roles and positions or or is there like a u- unique twist or spin you put on like the different roles that go into being in the two two one uh we we use the controller gapper you know the reader taker and, and the teaser i use that terminology but i find uh, myself whenever we're in a game and i'm making adjustments in the game i'll refer to them as tops middles and backs well, because yeah, a little less, a little, you know, they're a little clear. Yeah, yeah, they're interchangeable, and it's not the kids don't aren't looking at me going, okay, which one am I? The, the controller or the gapper? You're a top because the roles are interchangeable depending on what yeah. side the ball is on, and the, the middles are the same way, and then the back, you know. So it's real quick to say, hey, we're subbing a guy in. You're a back. You're a middle. Okay, and now you know where they go, uh, and that's. That's how we do it. Uh, I, I use, find myself using, when I teach it, I definitely use the terminology that uh, Wahlberg does. Uh, but whenever I'm in it, I'll say, hey, you're a top, you're a back. Because once I understand the positions themselves, it doesn't matter if you're a reader or a taker. It just depends on which side the ball's on. So I know in implementing uh, the 2 one press, how vital it is for that person in the front uh, whether they end up being the controller of the gapper, but whoever it is, it's going to be in the front of your two, two, one press is so important in order for the whole machine to run the way that it needs to. And I know one of the challenges I found is getting that player, not just physically, but sort of mentally ready for what they're going to need to do in order to, you know, pick up the ball right away and, and, and play defense the right way and then get into the the whole trapping uh, aspect of, of that press. So what, what do you do to kind of get the, those players in the front, um, you know, whether it's that, that controller, the, the person up top, uh, what do you do to kind of get them ready so they know what they need to do in order for the press to run well? Yeah, yeah I really, really um, applaud those guys because it is hard to, to play that position. So what we do is we really try to say, hey, these are the hardest working kids you know, in our program, these are the toughest mentally and physically kids that we have playing this position because not everybody can do this. Uh, you really have to to sell out. And, uh, you know, like uh, Coach Wahlberg had said, I, I use it all the time. I said, if you're doing it right, you should be begging me for a, a break in a minute and a half to two minutes. Uh, so I really try to tell the kids, I need four kids that are willing to do this. And you just have to be relentless and, and never quit and just – chase that ball. I said, we're going to bird dog them everywhere we go, be in a little small town here that likes to hunt. Yeah, uh, I, like that. I, say, I like that. You know, we're just going to chase them. I said, if they, if they dribble to the bathroom or they dribble to the concession stand, you follow them until they stop and turn around and try to throw it <laughs> across the floor. Excellent. I said, you are, you are just chasing them everywhere. Uh, and I said, I want them to dream about you tonight because you are just in their face the entire time. And they, uh, they kind of like that. They, they, they enjoy that we really, you know, celebrate their efforts because they are, like you said, they are exactly uh, the people that get this thing going and uh, get the game moving. And I know one of the, the things that uh, I'm pretty sure coach Wahlberg talks about, and I I know I've emphasized with my girls, I'm curious if you kind of do the same thing is, is you, you run that sort of press and even the people uh, who are, who are up there in the front, like you're going to get beat sometimes. And you're going to, you know, it's going to get broken a couple of times. And I know one of the big points of emphasis in, in that press is it's not necessarily about winning, you know, in the first two minutes or the first quarter of the game, but the, the way that you sort of wear them down and keep at it and just keep being relentless on them. And then you really start seeing significant gains in the fourth quarter. And I know that that, that would always been kind of a bit of a, a struggle sometimes for some girls to, to overcome, almost explaining to them, like, obviously I don't want you to get beat, but like, 
just by the nature of what we're doing, like, like it happens. Uh, did, do you have that conversation or you, or you, are you, uh, not, not, not willing to concede, concede no, anything we, like that? Like I am. <laughs> I always try to think of it, uh, as a player, but you know, when I'm coaching it and I'm like, well, what we're asking them to do is impossible to yeah. be perfect at it all game. It's impossible. So I tell them, look, I, I, I said, I expect you to get beat. I said, I almost want you putting so much pressure on them to go up that sideline that I want you to get beat. Then I just want you to run as fast as you possibly can to get them cut off. Uh, because in our, in, in the press, the way that I have seen it ran, at least where we've had success, the steals are all on the other side of half court. Uh, they're not in that back court unless right. you're just really, second half you can get some of those steals in, in the back court because they're just tired and just throwing the ball around at that point. But I said, I, I, I expect you to get them cut off. I said, if you can turn them once, that's great. I know he wants them to be turned twice in the, in the backcourt. If you can turn them once and you can, but if you can make them just dead sprint from let's say free throw line to three point line at the other end of the court for 32 minutes, we're going to be successful. You just can't let them turn the corner on you and, and get to the middle. And uh, they're, they seem to be better with that. Uh, understanding that we're asking that, not asking them, hey, you've got to keep them in front of you and you've got to – because I just uh, – I know I could have not done – I couldn't have done that as a player. I'm not going to ask someone else to try to do that uh, as well. Yeah, and, and and one of the interesting – it's almost like the little, little, little chess match that um, I have to play or, or things that goes into it. Like if you really sell out and you really have that player, like you said, who's going to be chasing them to the popcorn stand, then – as a coach, you have to consider like, what is this player's expectations for me on offense? If I'm really telling them to, you know, run themselves into the ground on defense. And then you kind of have the a little situation, right? Sometimes where, you know, you don't maybe necessarily want to be, a, have your best player, even if they are like your best player as a two-way player, because if they sell out and do all the things you're hoping that they do on defense, next thing you know, like they, they can't get a jump shot and it's going 10 feet short because they're just exhausted. Yes. Yeah. You have to, it's a fine line with that because um, I typically put my better offensive players at that reader taker spot. Um, and then maybe my more defensive minded players are playing that controller gapper uh, spot. But again, you're right. Uh, that's why I, I say I need to be good at this. I need four good controller gappers mm -hmm. because they're going to have to be interchangeable and, you know, one and a half to two minutes at a time, always kind of subbing one of them or two of them just because if they're doing it right, they can't stay in and play, you know, 32 minutes. And just as a quick addition to that, that's, that's a good way to get uh, to get some buy-in and, and, and things related to, to playing time and things like that. You won't have to worry about players on, on your bench not getting in much in the game if you if you really go all out in a 2-2-1. They're going to have no choice but to be running a deep bench and throwing players uh, in and out of there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we typically will try to go – uh, eight to nine anyway, if we have um, a good team or a, even we'll say everyone is mostly the same. Like this year, we'd play, we played 15 guys at times uh, throughout the games, just because uh, we even got to the point to where we would sub in five in, five out to try to Hockey run this. Subs, just, yeah. Yeah, just to keep the game going. Uh, because it, it's natural uh, and everybody does this. It's natural to want to conserve energy at some point. Well, if we're pushing them on transition and then we're pressing you coming back and then we're pushing them on transition. Something has to give. Uh, and I just, I try to give those kids uh, breaks by subbing. We also, uh, up until I think it was February here, right before a couple weeks before regionals, we were still playing in mask as well. Yeah. So that was something you really had to, um, now I'm not saying that all of them were wearing them correctly all the time. They were more chin straps than, than <laughs> mask, yeah, but yeah. But it was still a, you know, a requirement here for the IHSA. So for us, just keeping that in mind, trying to sub a little bit more and, and play as fast as we could. The, the, the COVID timeouts, they called them here, or the uh, mask timeouts, they still did those all the way through. Those were almost more of a detriment to us than they were helpful because we wanted the game to go fast. And, and every, uh, we, you know, we have eight-minute quarters here. Every, every break after the four-minute mark, um, there was a 90 second timeout in plus your other timeouts here. So it, it hurt us trying to keep the game going fast more than helped. 
yeah you're, you're, you're getting in a groove you're wearing them out and all of a sudden hey why is all these stoppages for why, 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 why are they getting why are they getting all this recovery time we need to keep going yeah, yeah you're getting a, you know four more timeouts uh, yeah uh, that, let, that's tough let me let me let me ask here uh what what do you think goes into or how do you teach as I kind of think about some of the nuts and bolts related to the two two one press, the, the the trap itself. Um, are, are there any uh, things of emphasis or any points that, that that you really like to emphasize with your guys about how to how to trap someone correctly? For us, it's more of you know let you have to get them sped up to get into the trap, and then once you get them sped up, if you're the well, say you're the controller in this point, mm -hmm. so you're on the ball, you have to release contact from them. Uh, and get ahead of them to cut them off, knowing, hey, they might spin, they might cross over because you're trying to get ahead of them. That's okay because you have someone coming. Uh, but if they stop and pick that ball up, if you get them stopped, you, can, you are not allowed to put your hands inside and try to grab the ball. We are not trying to, at any point in time, trying to steal the ball with the controller and the gapper running at them. Your job is to tip that ball make them throw it high, make them throw it around you so our, uh, you know, our, our, our reader can come in and, and get that ball, get the steal. Uh, so we really, uh, we track uh, deflections because that's, that's a steal for them. Yeah, sure. Uh, Getting those touches there on the ball. Because, I mean, you run this, so you know, there's nothing worse than you get that person headed up the sideline, they get them trapped, they spin, and that <laughs> gapper comes running right in there and grabs for the ball and fouls. And you're just like, oh, and, we yeah. had them right where we wanted them. <laughs> and, and I feel like sometimes I, I can almost see it happening in slow motion. I'm like, oh no, I know it's I know it's happening. Oh, <laughs> yes. And yep, there we go. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. No, you're absolutely now, right to do all that work, right? And especially when you have your player like your um controller, you know, really, really working, running themselves ragged, doing what they want, and then the foul comes. You're like, oh well, try 95% of the way there almost. Yes. And, and I, I tell my kids, I said, for this to be successful, this press to be successful, you only need to be in the right spots or, or rotating and, and doing, I said, you'll, you'll do it perfect maybe twice, three times a game where it's the perfect rotations. I said, but you need to be like 70% right and just play as hard as you can. And this, this press will be successful because the Second part of even getting the ball to turn over, I mean, you know as well as I do, sometimes you can turn the ball over like crazy and, with this press, and other times you don't get turnovers. But what I have found is you get quick shots. Uh, teams are taking, as long as you don't give up layups, they're wanting to take quick, uh, seems like baseline <laughs> jumpers. And to me, that's as good as a, as a turnover if they're going to take a quick baseline jumper from 15 to, you know, 17 feet. I will Absolutely. tell you, as, as, as again, as somebody who, who runs this, it is, it is so funny to have those conversations with my girls when we, we speed a team up, you know, even if they break it, they're taking a shot right away, and then we get pressed, and then we fall right into their, their, their game of taking a shot right away, and it's like, girls, what did we just talk about? One of our goals of this press, speed them up, and here we are getting pressed, and we take a shot in two seconds, so yes, you're absolutely yeah. right, because... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for, and 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 just as any any good press, and and you know this too, even even hopefully under some, some of the not ideal conditions, if the press gets broken, at the very least, you've had them take more time than they probably wanted to to set up your offense, and at least made it a little bit more disjointed and hard working for them to do it, rather than just kind of walk off the court and set it up. Yes, yeah, and I I, I personally, and it's maybe it's just the way that I like would have liked to have played and played as a player. I, I like to get up and down the court. Uh, it's more fun to watch. It's more fun to play. Um, it's, it's just more exciting basketball and, and more people are involved. Again, if we're walking the ball with the court all game, I could play five players if I'm not in foul trouble. Yeah. yeah. But if I'm getting up and down the floor like this, it's a lot easier to get buy-in from kids when they're getting time. Uh, and they're getting opportunities to score. They're getting opportunities for steals because we're, we're up. If you'll run the floor, in this and you'll work hard in the press and then run the floor, you've got a chance to get six, eight points a game that you couldn't probably do that based off of your skill level playing in a half court game where we're playing five on five. 
And this is something slightly, at least unique in my experience, experience to boys. And I think that's just kind of like something about the press in general. I, I, I think that uh, boys really in particular like getting into somebody's face you know on defense and trying to make them turn over the ball and try to almost like embarrass them in a sense you know they, they don't want to just make it that easy for them to walk up the court they want to get up on them and kind of get them flustered and kind of force that turnover I, th I think boys at least from what I've seen they kind of like really enjoy that challenge of trying to you know test test the other ball handler and see you know what they're really about sort of thing yeah yeah absolutely and and typically I mean if you look at it uh we always say it, you're only as good as your point guard. Um, I've had some yeah. really talented post players and stuff over the years, uh, both on the boys and the girls side. And if we didn't have a point guard to go with them, they just weren't as effective as we could have been. Sure. But I've also had years where you had, you know, average players around a really good point guard and you were able to be successful because they can control everything. So with this press, you might have a really good point guard that's, that's able to beat it most of the time. But for that two or three minute span, at some point in the game, they aren't beating it. And now their shot is short. And now they're, I mean, it's just those types of things that you just, you wear on someone and you kind of take them out of the game a little bit. Yeah. From that standpoint. Now they might get 20 on you before they get tired, but uh, eventually you can wear them out. And, and, and to that point, you know, they, they, they start, they score a little bit on you, you know, it, it is what it is. But then all of a sudden, like you said, you get that like one trip where maybe, you know, you force a turnover and then you get like another trip where they take a bad shot or another trip where now they're tired and their shot isn't there. And then it's like in the back of their mind, like, oh man, it's only like the third quarter and I know this press isn't going away. And then, you know, there's a huge mental aspect to that too. And it's a mental aspect to, for, for the team that you're playing against to, try to overcome the fact that, you know, they're, they're, they're tired and getting stressed out on it. But then as we talked about, like the mental aspect of like you as a coach, believing it in it enough that you tell your players, right. To like stick the course on this, like, trust me, like we, this is going to work if we just continue going at it because you might get a little uh, side eye looks at the beginning when, when they might be getting a few shots up against you, but, uh, but it's, it's the trust that you have that it does work that, that will uh, hopefully at least ultimately pay off, right? Yeah, that, and you're exactly right. You, you can hear it sometimes even in the stands. Uh, <laughs> yep. Whenever. Not that, that I know, know about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you're giving up some points and you're like, oh, you just, just stop the ball or, or just whatever. And it, it's, I have learned to adjust with it. I, I have found, uh, you know, maybe coming out after halftime, if we've been running it the whole time, the first three possessions or so of the second half don't run it. Because what did they spend their entire <laughs> halftime talking You're about? Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know from experience, and, and you know this as a coach, you'll talk about something for the entire halftime that you need to, to get work, to get fixed. And they come out and they don't do it. But then a couple minutes later, they put it on, and it's like you never talked about it. Yep. <laughs> and, and that's kind of what we try to do a little bit. We'll change up our defenses in the half court too, just to, uh, especially when we, uh, you know, if you don't have better athletes, night in and night out, try to do things to change it up just to make them slow down a little bit mentally so you can speed them up physically and see what you can do and, and, and have success. We, we played a really tough schedule this year, uh, and then one of the teams, well, actually two teams in our conference, went to the super sectional, the Elite Eight, and played each other. And then one of those teams that, that – the team Monticello that won the game ended up getting second in the state in, in two of this year. So we played in a really tough conference. and. You know, one of the uh, best compliments I got was at the Monticello game. I think they beat us by 15 or 17 this year. And he goes, you guys are really tough to prepare for. And I thought, well, that's something in that. And that's, you know, they want to walk the ball up the court and we just made them play our game. They were just better. Yeah. That, that is a nice feeling, you know, you're like, am, am I, am I, did I do anything? Did I have to make you work at least or anything and have, have to make you think a lot? Like, okay, I did. Perfect. And that's, and that's some ways how you have to measure progress. You know, it's not always just wins and losses. It's, you know, what, what effort was given and how did you have to, how hard did you have to make that other team or coach work to get the result that they wanted? And in, in, in some cases that, that that's more satisfying than maybe some of those wins that you can get over like, you know, lesser prepared or lesser experienced teams. Yeah. I mean, if you can, 
again, it's stealing those points. Like I talked about, you know, last season we were the conference champions uh, yeah. without a playoff system. And then this year we finished two and eight in our conference, uh, but had five games that were, you know, five points or less. And it was just literally from my kids just worked so hard. Sure. It, uh, it, they were outmatched, uh, you know, basketball talent wise, but they just worked so hard. And, and I think that's this press gives them, it, it, it kind of makes them tougher because they have to be to play this press. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's what I, I like about it. You can really, you know, hang your hat on it uh, as a whole program for them to know, look, this is what we do. And we just, we have to work harder than everybody else. That's, you know, so Derek, Jeter quote, you know, there may be feeling more talented than you, but there's no one that should work harder than you. And we kind of try to live that mantra, uh, you know, in our program because of it. I have great hardworking kids and, and we've been fortunate to have them everywhere we've coached. And it's been a, uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah. No, oh, that, that's excellent. Uh, going back to the second layer. And it's actually a thought that came to my mind when I heard you talk about um, the fact that, you know, your, your best offensive player is, isn't necessarily going to be the one who, uh, is going to be running up and down the, the court as the controller um, or the gapper. But uh, it made me think that, you know, if your best or better offensive player is the one who, who's doing the read and trying to get the steal, it's probably one of the best positions you'll be in because then you have like your the, the ball hopefully can get stolen or get that deflection and go in the hands of uh, maybe your best playmaker on offense. So what goes into yeah. you uh, teaching about how to read and how to be that one who stays disciplined and is reading the ball and able to not only uh, potentially be on the lookout for, for a steal off a deflection, but also kind of make sure that, you know, there, there's no easy pass going by him. How, how do you kind of go for the process of making sure uh, the, the reader is, is where they need to be and, and doing the best they can do? You know, I think that that's, it's a great question. That's to me, the hardest position to teach is that, that I would reader agree. taker. Spot. I would agree. I've seen, uh, uh, just, just to add to that, some real frustrations yeah. on my end of like real good traps and real, real, real good work being done that way. And then all of a sudden, like a, a cheap pass happening or something that like completely should be inexcusable. And I'm like, uh, you know, what can I do better to, to make sure we shore that up? So yeah, go ahead. But I, I completely yeah. agree. No, I, and I, I kind of kids that I look for to play that spot on the girl side, I looked for soccer players, uh, and I looked for outfielders, uh, because they kind of understand angles mm -hmm. as, as much as anything else. And, and, and on the boys' side, I really like defensive backs to play that, that spot. Uh, and then, you know, again, outfielders or soccer players, because you have to be comfortable with the man that you're guarding, which is totally irrational compared to the rest of basketball. But you have to be comfortable with the, the person that you're guarding playing behind you. So you're in between the ball and your man and the baskets behind you. So you have to, really teach that person that it's okay to, to be in front of them. We're going to try to make them drop in a perfect pass because we've got this teaser that's got your back. Uh, mm. Because uh, what I have found more than anything else is those kids are, they're more content. They want to play more behind and play it safe. Like, well, well, man, if they complete this pass, then, you know, we're going to get scored on. Yeah, they might, but they might complete that three out of 10 times if you're playing in front of them versus 10 out of 10 uh, you know, if you're playing behind him. Uh, mm. So it, it's for, for me, I really look for people that are willing to take chances. I mean, you can see these kids uh, when we, you're doing a lot of transition drills, a lot of press drills, you're trying to find those kids that, man, maybe they get beat every so often, but they're willing to, to lay it out and go for that steal. And they understand like, I, here's what I can go for. Here's what I go for. I mean, I, you running this press, you know, you see it probably 10 times a game where they dribble up the sideline, they spin, they throw it right to the middle, and your kid's about one second or even a half a second too late to, from getting that steal. Oh, or you see it like where they, they here and you talk about these situations. <laughs> yes, yes. You're correct. And, and it's like, man, if you just wouldn't have hesitated and you're just gone. Uh, because the hardest part for me that I've learned is, you know, they're dribbling that ball across half court and they're getting – let's say free throw line extended and they're about to get stopped. You can see it as a coach or you can see it from the stands. They're about to get stopped and they're not really to the basket. They're going to stop on that sideline and you turn and look for your reader taker or your, your reader at the time you're looking for them and they're standing under the basket. 
<laughs> because they've mm -hmm. continued to drop thinking, well, I can't let the ball. And it's like, I try to tell the kids as that ball's getting to half court or going across half court and you're, and you see that it's going that way, instead of moving back, like everyone else does, you're coming up mm. and it's, yeah. we, we almost have to work at it in the half court, you know, like we're on the second half of this press now. All right. You're going to start at the, the circle of half court dribble into that free throw on extended area just to make this guy, all right, you're dropping now come up as soon as you see this um, because yeah. that's, you miss a lot of steals. <laughs> well, and, and and I think one of the one of, and we're, oh, I'll ask a kind of I'll ask a follow up question here in a little bit about that. But I think one of the the, the benefits almost in kind of doing that in the half court and really focusing on the responsibility of of, of the person um, you know look, looking to get the steal is there's so many different types of situations that the offense is going to be in that it you really do have to try and like like you kind of mentioned like kind of set up you know, whether it's like kind of in the half court, like, okay, now we're on like the second level or all the different types of situations are in, because, you know, as we know, there's going to also be all these different types of ways that teams are going to try and work around it or break it, or that trap is going to happen in different locations or the offense will be here and not there that it really does take a pretty, pretty high basketball IQ and a lot of different reps and situations that you sort of have to put your players into think like, Oh, what would I do if I was here sort of situation? Yeah, absolutely. And I have, I am, I am blessed. I have a fantastic, uh, you know, not only my wife giving her a plug as my assistant, but go. I have a, a, a fantastic freshman and sophomore coach that will come up and, you know, we'll run this press against the sophomore team and he'll do different things to us. And, and we'll tell him, Hey, there's no rules for you right now, breaking this press, do whatever you think you need to do or, or whatever you want to do. Just so my kids have to, you know, Wahlberg says it, see it and fix it. Uh, you know, you have to see it and fix it. And I tell them, I said, I can't tell you every way that teams are going to try to break this. And I said, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the game because there are so many different things. You're just going to have to see it and adjust. But if you can always make sure your ball side and you keep the ball out of the middle, we'll be successful in this press. Mm. And yeah. that's kind of how it's, we try to do it. It's one of those that, that you're exactly right. And, and And I think that that's a good sort of teaching point to sort of, think about as a coach and something that I, I, I try to reflect on as well is that it's, it's, it's going to be messy and it's going to, it's going to be one of those situations where you mentioned, like you can't, at least in my experience and, 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 and you, you can clearly uh, tell me if I'm wrong, like you, you can't exactly like put in a, a you know, a fishbowl or a really nice, perfect, you know, scenario about like the the running the two two one press in practice like you kind of just like you said bring up your freshman team bring up your sophomore team just sort of like let it happen and I feel like that's so much more valuable to just let it sort of naturally take place and see it organically happen rather than try and like concoct this very specific scenario and situation that's probably could potentially happen but it, it didn't naturally get to that point if you set it up and, you know, you try to make it like this very perfect ideal sort of situation. Yes. Yeah. I know. I completely agree. And that's why I think this press is probably more successful off of misses than it is off of makes. Uh, just because uh, typically on a, on, on a miss, we have found their teams, you know, they, they go to their press break all the time whenever we're going uh, mm -hmm. uh, on a miss, on a make, because they know that it's coming, but you'll catch those teams that people just kind of take off and turn their back. And I, I tell my controller gappers there, I tell them, I said, you're the only ones that are truly like crashing the boards. And I said, one of you is on the ball. You just, as soon as that ball is caught, I don't care if it's the, the post player that won't take two dribbles, you're on the ball. And I said, and the second one is either trying to get ball side or at the free throw line, you're going to get the next pass. And mm -hmm. we're trying to speed this thing up. And uh, they don't typically, um, just what I found is, you know, off of a miss, it's not as, uh, I, I guess, it's a lot more hectic for the offense to, to set up into their press break. Because it, it, it is a lot, you know, when you're, when, it, when you're scored on, you expect to get pressed. Or at least most time you expect, all right, we're going to get pressed on a, you know, want to score. So I'm going to go out of my spot and get ready to go. Yeah, but yeah, you know, yeah, it's a lot more. I'm going to go here. This is what we're running. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's why I really like to do it off of that. Uh, we, um, we don't put our post players, if you will, we don't put them on a, on the rebound for a free throw. We put our controller gappers in there 
and uh, we're trying to just, you know, keep it going that way. Um, I really like if you can do it, if you can have a, your, your five man, if he can be a, a reader taker and then my point guard and sometimes maybe your best ball handler can be your, your teaser hmm. be, because that your point guard is typically the one that's at the top of the key yeah, uh, or, or at least at the high on offense. So a shot goes up, they can naturally just kind of drop back to keep that away. And then if you've got, you know, we've, I've even played my five. I have a, a really athletic five right now. That's, He's played a controller gapper before some because I wanted to offensive rebound. Uh, huh. And yeah. And it's been it's been successful that way too from time to time now. I, I'd like to tell you everything works, but <laughs> <laughs> no, always. no, but it's some it is something interesting to think about though, or to at least consider. Cause like like you said, there are like you said, there's you know, you, you can see it and you can you know watch videos or go to clinics on it, but then once you actually see it run with your guys, that that's when you actually think like, well, what if I try this or what if I make this adjustment and kind of tinker it or twist it a little bit based on like who your personnel is. Yeah, we have we have so much. We have I've tried to explain to the kids too. Look, you're in you're in man, or you're in a traditional two two one until the dribble happens. Then all bets are off. <laughs> uh, but if they're going to try to break it and they bring a bunch of people up, I'll bring my reader takers up to you know the three point line, and just have them kind of stay stay skinny so to speak inside the probably just outside the lane lines. Yep. And just try to say that. And I said, wherever the first pass goes, let's say your guy runs up, you know, they, they break it a traditional, we'll say traditional, they have two guys at the elbows and then two to three guys at half court and one of them runs up the sideline to catch it. Uh, our reader takers want to go flying up there with them. And I said, no, don't. Uh, let them go up there and catch it. The controller grapper will go over and start that trap. But the guy that was at the elbow is now going to cut right behind that. And that's the guy you have to take and take mm -hmm. that pass away. Uh, and they've, you know, we've, we've had some kids that are really good about understanding that and others, uh, you know, have not been, uh, but yeah, it, it's funny how people try to try to beat it. They either try to bring a bunch of people up or they try to send a bunch of people back. Uh, it's, it, that's it, the fun chess part of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that, that, you know, that was one of the questions I was going to ask you in my experience, I I've seen a lot of people try to try to bring a bunch of people up. You know, I see like the, uh, the four across a lot, you know, the, the you know, the one inbounder and the yep. four across. And, and that, that's typically, that's typically what I see, which, which to me, I mean, if I, if I can be in a situation where I can force you to have to bring all of your guys up there, well, perfect. That works for me. If you want to, if you want, if we want to go do things that way. So I, that, that was going to be my question is what, what do you kind of see, especially because as you mentioned, uh, it doesn't seem like many teams in your area are, are running a two, two, one. So they're going to either be caught off guard on it or they have to spend some time in practice specifically working on trying to break it and counter it. So I was, I was going to ask, what, what, do you, what do you see teams trying to do and what do you do sort of in response is kind of like a counter counter to that? Yeah, no, you'll, you'll have those people to bring up. It's funny, um, when we put this press in, uh, oh gosh, it's been seven or eight years ago now <laughs> when I got a hold of this. I'm like, let's try this. Uh, we were coaches so a girls team in, in Decatur, St. Teresa, and I said, "What do you want to call this? You know, what do you want to call this press?" And one of the girls says, "Cougar," and I was like, "Okay, you know, sure." Well, we've continued to call it Cougar from here on out. So it, it's funny for me whenever I hold up my C or I say, "Hey, we're in Cougar after this," the other coaches start talking, "Hey, press break, press break." <laughs> you know, it's I guess it's we're known enough for it to know that it's coming that every coach is yelling it out. Uh, that it happens, but yeah, one of the, to get back to what your question was, one of those is, yeah, they'll bring us four up, but the, the, the main part that I've seen now is they'll break it in like a, a two, two, one pattern. Uh, but if the ball is on, you know, the right side of the floor, they're going to take those two middle press break people and put them one in the middle and one opposite week. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, I think that would be better for us because now you don't have the pass up the floor, up the sideline. Yeah. Uh, but what our kids end up doing, and it takes us a, it takes them a long time to understand it. I tell our kids when, when they're doing it, you two just shift over and match up with them. Right. So 
because on the boy side, it, it, this pass wasn't as open on the girl side, uh, but on the boy side, they'll take that pass and they'll put a kid down on a block. So my teaser kind of has to stay down there a little bit and they'll throw that ball cross court, you know, from the right side to the left side to that deep guy. Uh, because my kids are playing it, you know, like they've been taught their ball side, you know, cause we talk about splitting the court into quarters, you know, they're, they're, they're on ball side. So that pass is open. When I finally get them to shift over and just match up and I say, Hey, you're manned up with these guys. Uh, it gets better because then it forces them to dribble because I mean, ultimately that's what you know what this press needs to be. And the, the dribble has to happen to initiate everything. Yeah. If yeah. you're allowed to pass through it, it's not helping any of us. We might as well play just the traditional two, two, one, if we're allowed to pass through it. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I, I need, I need things to slow down. The easiest way for it to slow down, just, just dribble. Once you start dribbling, we're perfect. Yes. This is exactly what we need. Just don't beat us to the middle. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that's, you know, we, we spend a lot of time on, especially if we see in games that we're getting beat on it a lot, we'll spend a lot of time in practices, just getting beat to the middle. Where does everyone go? Yeah. And we talk about, you know, those reader takers, Hey, just, he calls an umbrella. I think it is, or a cushion. Uh, I said, Hey, you're just slowing them down. I said, slow, I said, slow them down, but keep your hands up because hopefully that controller gapper is going to punch that ball out from behind and it's going to hit you right in the face. So be ready to catch the ball. <laughs> Uh, and we've had that happen a couple times where the kid, you know, is ready and just they tip that ball right up to him and then the other one takes off and it's a layup. Well, well there, there's definitely value in, in practicing that sort of situation of, okay, what happens if it goes middle? What happens if, you know, things break down a little bit or get beat? Because, again, as we talked about, by the nature of kind of running this, like especially in the beginning of the game, you are going to get beat. So it's good to, you know, almost anticipate that and be like, well, when, you know, maybe say if, but when this happens, now, now what do we do so that, when it does happen in a game, it's not like, oh, well, we, it, it got broken and now we're completely out of sorts. And we don't know what we're doing anymore. So like practicing that situation, because as we talked about as a coach, you know, it's going to happen by as just a byproduct of running that press uh, will definitely yield some benefits, especially at the beginning of the game before you uh, completely worn the other team down. Yes. And, and that's, I mean, teams know, I mean, you watch this press or, you know, we play everybody once a year, but we play everybody, you know, we play the same teams every year. They have game film on us and, mm -hmm. and we trade, we trade film. They see that we're trying to get that ball up the sideline. They see that we're trying to make you dribble. So they're purposely trying to practice against that. And rightfully so. Right? <laughs> we're trying to take away what teams do or uh, do those things to us. So if kind of what I, uh, we've worked on is, Hey, tr we're trying to turn the ball. We try to, we want to drill the sideline. We want to keep the ball in the middle as much as possible. But the third part of our press really is, hey, just don't give up layups. You might yeah. give up some, but for the most part, let's make them jump shooters. Sure. And uh, hopefully it's a quick jump shot and they miss it. And we have to make sure we get the rebound. Uh, but I've told, uh, try to tell the kids, and this press is not, if you're wanting to hold someone to 20 points a game or something, this is not the press to run. <laughs> uh this it absolutely is not. I mean, that's just not. You're not going to be successful, and you're going to be frustrated all the time if you are. Uh, I'll say risk adverse from the standpoint yeah. of giving up points. Uh, we know we're going to give up points doing this, and, and that's that's part of it. But again, I hopefully you're you're seeing the same thing. And in, in a lot of games, especially the ones where you're successful, there's a two minute, three minute stretch where you score 15 points. Or, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a 15 to two run and, and it happens so quickly that even the other coaches don't necessarily even call a timeout yeah. because the game is continuing to go. Uh, and that's where we have had, you know, success. We, you know, we, we won seven games this year and three of those wins were probably putting this press, we'd take the press off for a little while and come back to it and put it on and going on a eight, two run or a, you know, a 10 0 run near the end of the game to give us the opportunity to, to even be in a position to win. And, uh, and, and that goes back to what we talked about, about just the, just the belief in general that you have it and, and knowing like you, you're going to give up some stuff. Like you said, it's, if you're risk averse, you shouldn't be running it. And just knowing like, well, if, if you don't know what we're trying to do here and you kind of look at it from the outside or look at it, you know, without like the trained eye, you might think I, you know, maybe I have no idea what I'm doing or what the purpose behind it is, but it, in theory, it, it all sort of comes together. Maybe sometimes 
better in some instances than, than others. But in theory, like you said, you get on that run, you start hitting those, those few turnovers and, and you start wearing them out. Or even if it's not like you talked about the turnovers necessarily, but you can just see that their offense just like doesn't look good or their jump shots don't look good, or they're just resorting to jump shots because they, they don't have that burst to get to the rim. Like th those are the victories when, 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 when you know it's being run the right way. Yes, absolutely. I mean, we, I go back to two years ago. Um, I we had been teaching this press, but again, we had you know, I think four practices, five practices, and the game started because we weren't going to get to play. We weren't going to play. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you can play, um, and your season has to be done in six weeks. So, I was teaching it, and the kids kind of remembered it a little bit from the year before because we weren't really we weren't a lot of summer necessarily. We just a lot of things. But I was teaching it, teaching it. And I'm like, I don't know if they're ready. I don't know if they're ready. And then we were losing to a team, uh, a good team in our conference. By it was ten at halftime, and uh, you can imagine it wasn't probably the best halftime speech that we had <laughs> uh, with the kids. But I said, here's the deal. I said, we're gonna cougar. We're gonna, you know, that's our press. We're gonna do it. Make miss. We are just. We're gonna make them quit. You know, we're we're gonna make them quit. Uh, and the kids responded to it. And that's the first time I implemented it full time. Uh, in those in that season last year and ended up winning the game by 18 but what was impressive for me to see with my kids is the other team I don't like to see the other team arguing but they were arguing with each other look you got to get back you got to do it. because they it was just pure chaos for them and for us we were in our element mm -hmm. and if if you can create that especially uh you know when when we were able to have, we weren't able to have crowds that year. I mean, we, I think we were allowed 50 people in the gym or less. Uh, but when those things were happening, I mean, I just think about if we'd had a full gym, that place would have erupted Sure. for things like this, just because, I mean, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we averaged that year 71 points a game. Yeah. That, yeah uh, and that's fun. And, and had to take people, I, I had to sub out to not let us score a hundred multiple times. So uh, it was, you know, the kids love playing that way. They, some of those seniors that come back or kids that graduate now come back and say, man, I, I miss it. Just the up and down that that created. I mean, it's, it's organized blacktop basketball if you're watching it from the stands. But there's really, you know, teaching this press, there's a lot that goes into it that you maybe wouldn't see if you weren't intimately involved. Well, and that's that's kind of one of the nice parts, I think, about it in, in its own way is that going back to what we kind of talked about, you might think by looking at it, if you're not too well trained in it, that you like, oh, all I got to do is, you know, do this and this to to break it or like this is all that's happening in it. So, you know, I don't have to worry too much about it. But once you really get to know it, you're like, wait a minute, all the, 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 these players do have these very specific roles and there's all this nuance and all these little weight things that go about it that. You know, if you almost like take it for granted or just kind of make some assumptions about what's happening, it'll you'll, you'll, you'll get burned pretty quickly by it and uh, have to realize, oh, I probably should uh, spend some more time looking at film about it. Yes. And, and you know, I think even players get a little bit uh, uh, lackadaisical in it, too. Yeah, kind of lulled by Bre it. Yeah. Breaking it because like, OK, I know that guy's going to be coming. So as soon as I start to dribble, I know that they're coming. I just got to make sure that I get that pass off early. Well, then you're your reader starts adjusting and starts scooting up a little bit more and a little bit more. Now that pass early is not open. Like, oh, Where do I happened? go with it now? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now, now all of a sudden the teaser comes flying up and steals that ball from the middle. Cause you're teaching them to take chances too. Uh, and they're like, well, that shouldn't have happened. Or, all right, I'm going to throw that cross court skip. Well, if you're teaching your teaser to kind of play that weak side and they come flying from, you know, 20 feet away to steal that, uh, it, you can see it really mess with people you know, mentally uh, mm -hmm. out there on the court. And, uh, you know, the kids really like that. They like, they feel like, and I think all kids are like this. They like to feel like they have a strategic advantage yes. um, and they believe in it more. Whereas this press is only as good as your players, just like anything else. But yeah. what helps it is that your press, you're doing something a little bit different that they just don't see every day. And that's what I think allows them to feel like they have that strategic advantage. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I, I know something that you don't sort of thing. Like yes. I, I have, I have knowledge about something that you don't understand. And 
and like it's it's kind of fun for them it's almost like they have like a the, like the secret or something right yeah they're, they're kind of you can see in the huddle it, it, this was girls more than boys yeah uh, but it was so much fun when you say hey we're gonna go into we're gonna go into cougar we're gonna go into our press and they're kind of looking at you like yeah yeah you know like they feel like they've just been given the golden ticket uh and you see them go out there and then you see it work and you see the other team call a timeout and they're so excited coming back to the the bench or to back to the huddle because yeah yeah we got them type of a thing mm -hmm. uh, and we i my goal uh with my players all the time is i want to make them call the first time out mm -hmm. uh, if i can make them call a timeout out of frustration then we've got an edge sure. we've got an edge and i'm I'm probably bad about calling timeouts anyway. I like, I let my kids play through a lot. <laughs> so um, you're probably going to call the first timeout unless <laughs> it's really going bad against us. And then I'll call one. But uh, yeah, I just, you know, again, kids want to feel like they've got the, the secret sauce, so to speak. And that's what I try to give them. Yeah. I like that a lot. Uh, before we hit our concluding segment, coach, I do want to ask you specifically if there's any sort of breakdown drills or things that you like to do in your practice just in terms of refinement, improvement. I know we kind of talked about uh, bringing like the, the younger team up or kind of like letting it get broken down in that first layer and kind of going from there. But were there any other, whether it's even like one-on-one -on -one or two-on-two, -two, any other sort of like ways that you work on refining and improving it to uh, maximize the press's effect? Yeah, we will. Uh, we'll do a two-on-one drill where it's a, you know, a controller and a gapper versus mm -hmm. the ball handler. And we just tell that ball handler, hey, try to get, you know, you get this whole half the floor try to get all the way down to the basket and score. And, and they've got to learn to trap and to chase and to, to do those things where, and then we'll add, a, you know, then we'll add a second player that they can kick it back to and add the, the reader taker. Um, we really, what I have seen is more important or is really important is to work on the punch outs. We try to spend yeah. time working on, working on the punch outs. I don't know how many times we've got a perfect punch out opportunity and the kid swings down to try to get that ball and it's a foul, foul every yeah. time it should yeah. be a foul every single time uh just because of that um and so we really try to work on that but more than anything it, it we will do um a lot of just playing it and then mm -hmm. you know let that play finish and then say hey they were here they went here here's where you should have been uh but i I've, I've tried to get better over the years from as soon as, you know, we tell them we can't let the ball go middle in any press or anything, instead of stopping it as soon as it goes middle and, you know, getting after them, I try to let them play it out to see how they adjust to it and then talk about, okay, here's where we should have been. Uh, and that's just, uh, again, that this press to me, it's, it's a lot of rotations and knowing what to do, but mostly it's just guts and, and work and, uh, I, maybe that's what I like about it because I maybe wasn't always the most talented, but I could work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and that's what's fun about it. I, you know, I like the idea of, you know, just letting it kind of go, even if, you know, the initial uh, actions aren't, aren't good or it's kind of getting broken down because again, we're repeating it for the third time here I am is it's going to happen in the game. And it's not like your players can just stop and have it get reset and be like, Oh, let me try that again. Sort of situation. <laughs> so let it happen yes. and see what they think. Cause that's going to give you a lot of, knowledge and a lot of insight as a coach when you see what your player's decision making is once that you know first level is broken down and there are times that i'm sure you've ran into it where i'll say hey why didn't you take away the middle why did this and they're like well i was worried about blah 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 the guy on the weak side and when they tell you like okay i get it that makes sense or no don't worry about him trust that someone else is going to be there because this mm -hmm. this press is a lot about trusting Right. You've got to be able to, you've got to have a team to trust each other because I'm leaving a player to go help another person. I have to trust that you're going to be there or that my teaser is going to stop the ball going on the way of the basket. That allows that taker to, or the reader to go up and try to get the steal because they trust that they'll take away that pass. And, yeah. Uh, so uh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, like, like you said, you, uh, and knowing what your players are thinking and actually being able to pick their brain, but like, what did you see there? Like, oh, and then as a coach, I know when I have those situations, either, well, either I didn't communicate something wrong, or maybe you saw something good that I didn't see, or like, oh, okay, I, I see why you saw this, but this is what we actually need to do sort of thing. But you, you gain so much about 
what your players are understanding, not just of the press, but of the game in general. If you literally just ask them, like, what did you see there? Or, you know, what, what made you make that sort of decision? Like, incredible insight you can, you can gain from that at, by asking that question. Absolutely. I, I, I love it from the standpoint of the kids, if the kids that are engaging you in those kind of questions. Well, what if they do this? Or I did this because of this. Or why is, you learn, you're making them think the game. So it's not always. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want it to be a dictatorship. But the best teams that we've had, even if they weren't the most talented, the the most fun I've had coaching, and I think my wife would say the same, are the, is the kids that are engaged and they're asking those questions and are doing those things because they truly want to learn. It's not a do it because I said so type of a thing. It's, you know, why are you thinking that? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's I, I hope that we're creating lifelong students or lovers of the game by yes. our coaching that's uh, something that we want to you know strive to do and and they can go anywhere and 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 one day maybe when they're coaching their you know their their little second grade travel team or whatever they'll remember some of the things that we told them when they're teaching their you know their kids and and do that and we've had a lot of players go into coaching and that's really cool yeah no that that that's excellent it's like the little you see the cro the coaching tree grow right uh, that's an awesome feeling uh, Coach, to wrap up, there's a couple of questions I ask every guest, so I'll go ahead and get started on this first one. Uh, thinking back on your coaching career in general, what is a moment from your career that you think others listening would be able to learn from? Well, I think the biggest, you know, the coaching moment is I did a couple of things. I took a chance where I, one, I, I got to work with, and I get to, again, I get to work with my wife every day coaching. That is so much fun, but that would have never happened if I'd have said no. To coaching girls yeah bring it back around. <laughs> uh, so yeah. with that you know I, I and i i learned to communicate better i think um because you know for the for the most white boys and girls communicate differently mm -hmm. uh, and i learned to be a better teacher of the game and what i was trying to explain to them by understanding the way that they're thinking. And then now I find uh, sometimes when I'm coaching on the boys' side, I probably am a little bit over-explaining because I want to make sure they understand it. And uh, uh, I always, I'm always asking, you understand what I'm saying? You understand? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Because I, I want them to, uh, I always, I, as a player, I always had to know the why. So as a coach, yeah. I, try to, I try to teach the why. Uh, because the worst thing that, that could happen to me, I think, is if we're asking a player, you know, what do you, do, why do you do this? What do you, you know, why did you do this? Uh, maybe it's dad when they get home. Is that, well, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And, and the kid's like, I don't know. Well, that doesn't give the parents much buy-in. <laughs> so maybe the, you know, take chances. a lot of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, maybe my advice would be take chances, you know, coach something that you're not familiar with. I, you know, I, I coached girls I thought, and it was a fantastic experience. And then on the other side is uh, teach the why. Because kids, I think, really do want to know. At least the, the invested ones do, for sure. They want to know the why. Yeah. And, it, I mean, to me, just to add on to that if, that, if that's what they ask, it shows that they actually, like, want to learn the game and understand why things are happening the way they do versus just kind of going for the motions on things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'll, I'll give a shout-out to a kid this year. He was probably, the you know, the 15th man on our team. And we had our banquet here not too long ago, and I said, you know, I will keep this boy on my team always because he works so hard. And I said, he asked great basketball questions. He's invested, even though he's maybe not getting the, the minutes that he'd want, he's invested and he wants to know. And I, and I've, we've made comments to those kids. Like you need to go into coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you see that kind of their eyes light up. Like, why would you think that? Like you ask great questions. You understand the game more than other kids. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so that's, you know, hopefully we're creating more coaches. We'll see. Yeah, no, that, no, that's excellent. That's, and that's, that's really cool to, to, to say that to, to your players. I think, I think maybe sometimes we assume that our players like to, or we're always going to want to be involved in basketball and in, in their life, or maybe naturally would want to get into coaching, but no, just, just say it to them if you believe it in them. And you might be the one to kind of plant that seed in them and, and get them going on their coaching journey. That's really cool. Uh, well, to wrap up, you know, coach, I give every guest what I call a 60 second soapbox. It's a platform for you to get out uh, your final thought, closing message, closing idea, kind of something that you would like to leave the listeners with. So 
Uh, I'm just going to let you kind of take the floor from here. And if you go over 60 seconds, that's fine too, because I don't have a stopwatch on me. So go <laughs> ahead, coach, you can take it from here. Sure. I, you know, I, I'm in a great position uh, from the standpoint of I'm not a teacher, but I get to coach. And even, even more so, I get to coach, you know, with my wife. But one of the coolest things that I found about coaching is we all end up, if you're really in it, you end up being a junkie of it because you just want to be involved in more of it. Uh, I would encourage people that you can touch so many lives by being a coach, whether it's travel, whatever, it's rec ball, it's, you know, second grade, uh, it's JFL. I, I coach all of those. But I have found by, by just – putting myself out there to coach kids and to do those things, you get to touch so many lives and you can impact them in ways that you don't even know is possible. Uh, and I know that, you know, much like officiating coaching, gets a bad rap now. And a lot of people are wanting to avoid it just because it's not worth the hassle. Um, I would argue it absolutely is worth any of those hassles that come because those will be few and far between if you're in it for the right, for the right reasons. And uh, I, I, again, I would encourage people to get involved if you love the game spread it uh, no matter what sport it is and let's let's grow this thing perfect really well said coach i want to thank you for spending some time talking about just your coaching journey and and, and then getting into the press and the way that you like to run it and uh all of the fun things that, that go into running the 221. And, and I couldn't encourage those listening enough to, you know, learn more about it, think about implementing it because it's, it's such a fun brand of basketball. And I, I think something as, as we both kind of discussed, the players really like to get into and really like to, to run. So, so coach, thank you so much for spending some time on that and best of luck going forward and uh, best of luck uh, running that 221 even more next year and keep on refining it. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate the time. I, I really enjoyed talking to you and if, if you have anyone that's interested in, in talking more about it, please send them my information. I'd be glad to help any way I can. Absolutely. Excellent. And thank you guys so much for listening. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast, and we will see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.